Today on Cross Defense, we ask the question, are we Christian nationalists? What is behind this thought-terminating cliche? And we're going to learn a little bit about Alex Zamanos, the faithful as well. Stick around for the next hour. All this and more is coming up on Cross Defense. Welcome back to another episode of Cross Defense. Thanks for clicking on the show if you're listening via podcast or tuning in if you're listening on the radio dial. Thanks for however you're tuning into the show. Thank you for listening. This is the show. Cross Defense is the show where we aim to equip your mind, excite your imagination, and comfort your soul all with God's word, rightly divided between law and gospel, distinguishing between the two as is appropriate. I'm your host, the Reverend Tyrell Bramwell, pastor of St. Mark Lutheran Church in Ferndale, California, a wonderful place to live out here on the north end of the Lost Coast. All right, so in the last episode, we took up the Christian response to American, particularly American politics, but to all politics, really, per a listener's question, and that was uh, in in wake of the uh, election day here in America. In that discussion... I read from Article 28 of the Augsburg Confession. We also dipped into Article 16. And we're going to go back there today as we square up, square up face-to-face with all this talk we're hearing today about Christian nationalism. Have you heard this? I've even heard uh, certain people in the, in the LCMS, the Lutheran Church Missouri Senate, talking about Lutheran nationalism and with a little bit of a negative tinge in their voice. And so maybe you're wondering, what is all this talk? We're going we're gonna to deal with it today. If you have a copy of the Book of Concord, I have mine here with me in the Winged Lion studio today, turn now to the Augsburg Confession. We're going to Article 28. We're going to start from the beginning. That's always a good place to start, from the beginning. <laughs> and I'm going to read from the Latin text side. If, you, if you're new to the Augsburg Confession, don't get confused. This is a, a unique book here in the Book of Concord because there's a German text and a Latin text. Both uh, tongues were used when the Lutherans presented this document to the authorities. So we have the Latin text side on the right and the German text side on the left. So when you flip the page, And in my version, I'm on page 91. So that means when I flip the page, I'm going to be going to 93 because the the Latin text is going to be every other page. You you get it. You're smart people out there. Of course you are. You're cross-defense listeners. You're tuned in here to KFUO, Christ for you, anytime, anywhere. And if you have Christ, you have wisdom. And uh, yeah, therefore, you're smart. See? Logic. Using the old noodle. (laughs) <laughs> All right, have you, uh, did I give you enough time to get your Augsburg Confession open? Did you find Article 28? It's concerning the church's power. All right, let's dive in, my friends. In former times, there were serious controversies about the power of bishops in which some people improperly mixed the power of the church and the power of the sword, that is, the power of the state. Tremendous wars and rebellions resulted from this confusion while the pontiffs relying on the power of the keys, not only instituted new forms of worship and burdened consciences with reservations of cases and violent excommunications, but also attempted to transfer earthly kingdoms and to take away from emperors the right to rule. Devout and learned people have long since condemned these vices in the church, and that is why our people have been compelled for the sake of instructing consciences to show the difference between the power of the church and the power of the sword, the power of the state. Recall from last week's episode, we were talking a lot about the ecclesial realm and the civil realm, still at play. They, and that they used here in this document is is us, the Lutherans. They are our people. They have taught that because of the command of God, both are to be devoutly respected and honored. This is what we teach as Lutherans, as the highest blessing of God on earth. We are to appreciate our pastors, the church, that those who give us God's word and administer his sacraments. And likewise, I know this is a radical thought. We are to appreciate our political servants, the authorities that we elect into office. We are, we are to respect them and, and appreciate all that they're doing. And they are to do it in good order. They should be, after all. 
If not, we need to vote those guys out, put new people in. However, back into the Augsburg Confession, however, they believe that, we believe that, according to the gospel, the power of the keys or the power of the bishops is the power of God's mandate to preach the gospel, to forgive and retain sins, and to administer the sacraments. These are the things that the church does, right? For Christ sent out the apostles with his command, John 20, 21 to 23, as the Father has sent me, so I send you, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. And Mark 16, 15, go and proclaim the good news of to the whole creation. Excuse me. Go and proclaim the good news to the whole creation. This power is exercised only by teaching or preaching the gospel and by administering the sacraments either to many, the corporate worship in the congregation, or to individuals. Think homebound, hospital visits, right? Uh, personal stuff. Depending on one's calling, so also uh, you know, we're going to be doing things according to whether we're pastors or, or parishioners, what our, what our calling is in, in the church. For not bodily things, but eternal things, eternal righteousness, the Holy Spirit, eternal life are being given. These things cannot come about except through the ministry of word and sacraments. As Paul says, Romans 1.16, the gospel is the power of God for salvation to everyone who has faith. And Psalm 119.50 says, your promise is gives me life. Therefore, since the power of the church bestows eternal things and is exercised only through the ministry of the word, it interferes with civil government as little as the art of singing interferes with it. For civil government is concerned with things other than the gospel. Listen to this. For the magistrate protects not minds, but bodies and goods from manifest harm and constrains people with the sword and physical penalties. The gospel protects minds from ungodly ideas, the devil, and eternal death. Do you see the distinction between the church and the state? The the state is meant to be protecting not minds, as we talked about in the last episode, not the minds, not the soul, but our bodies, our goods from manifest harm, and it's to constrain people with the sword with physical penalties. The gospel protects our minds, our souls, from ungodly ideas. That's the job of the gospel. That's the job of the church. From the devil and from eternal death. And in the German text, it says here, and this might be a little more familiar to our way of talking in America these days, secular power does not protect the soul, but using the sword and physical penalties, it protects the body and goods against external violence. One is all about the body, the temporal, the earthly, this worldly situation. The other one's all about eternity, heaven, spiritual matters. Consequently, The powers of church and civil government must not be mixed. The power of the church possesses its own command to preach the gospel and administer the sacraments. It should not usurp the other's duty, transfer earthly kingdoms, abrogate the laws of magistrates, abolish lawful obedience, interfere with judgments concerning any civil ordinances or contracts, prescribe to magistrates laws concerning the form of government that should be established. It's not supposed to do that. As Christ says, John 18, 36, my kingdom is not from this world. And again, in Luke 12, 14, who set me to be a judge or arbiter over you? And St. Paul says in Philippians 3, 20, our citizenship is in heaven. And in 2 Corinthians 10, 4, for the weapons of our warfare are not merely human, but they have divine power to destroy arguments. Okay, so that's our Article uh, 28 from the Augsburg Confession. Very helpful stuff in understanding uh, the, the Lutheran, which is the historic Christian perspective on the relationship between church and state. 
So here we see clearly that Lutherans have a sharp understanding of the difference between what we commonly call church and state in today's public discourse, right? The, in, in this realm, it's, it's called the, the, the sword, so, but so you don't get confused, right? Church and state. That's what we're used to, the language. And, and long before Thomas Jefferson wrote his letter to the Danbury Baptists, mentioning the wall separating the state from encroaching upon the church, that's, that's where in American discourse, public discourse, we get the language of separation of church and state. It, it's not from any formal government document. It's from Thomas Jefferson writing a letter to the Danbury Baptists. And, and the direction of the arrow is very important. It's not to keep the church out of the state, it's to keep the state out of the church, right? That's the situation going on there. And so long before that, Lutherans were writing and talking about the proper separation between the ecclesial and the civil realm, and how God is in charge of both of them, but they are, they are ruled by God in two different ways. Lutherans understand that God's word makes it clear that God rules the world by dividing it into these two kingdoms, the left hand and the right hand. One's ruled by law, by the sword, by might, and the other by gospel, by grace, by the word of God, forgiveness. One deals with earthly needs of of people. The other one is focused on the eternal needs of people. You You got the second article gifts and the first article gifts. Now, turning in our book of Concord, to the Augsburg Confession, Article 16, we also find help in this topic. So so go with me now to Article 16. This isn't very long, but this too helps us get a clear understanding. Concerning civic affairs is the title of this article in the Augsburg Confession, again, reading from the Latin text. Concerning civic, civic affairs... We teach that lawful civil ordinances are good works of God, and that Christians are permitted to hold civil office, to work in law courts, to decide matters by imperial and other existing laws, to impose just punishments, to wage just war, to serve as soldiers, to make legal contracts, to hold property, to take an oath when required by magistrates, to take a wife and to be given in marriage. Now, here's a little pause for a second. This is a great, great teaching tool of how the church has always understood marriage to be between a man and a woman. We Lutherans have a good understanding on all the things we're dealing with in our society. We just aren't the loudest voice in Christendom. We ought to be. We ought to speak up. Because here we have in our, one of our forming documents, the Augsburg Confession, laying out what it is we teach to our opponents who, who are saying we were teaching falsely, and we were forced to articulate what it is we're teaching and, and to defend it as faithful according to Scripture, we state here that we are able, Christians are able to take a wife and to be given in marriage. And in the Latin, the Latin terms there are denoting the male and the female. That's important to note, but kind of a different topic for today's show. Okay, so continuing in the, in the article 16, they condemn, we condemn the Anabaptists who prohibit Christians from assuming such civil responsibility. So the, uh, the churches, there's, there's more churches now splintering off, you know, going away from uh, Roman Catholicism at the time of the Reformation, and the Anabaptists is one of the groups, and they give us the Mennonites and the Quakers and, and these sorts of uh, different denominations today. And, and they're prohibiting Christians from participating in any of these civil responsibilities, judges, soldiers, uh, legal contracts, all this, all this stuff. It's completely a different realm, and so they're not to do, do with it at all, okay? Because the gospel transmits an eternal righteousness, the document continues, of the heart, we also condemn those who locate evangelical perfection, and that's... That's the fancy way of saying monasticism, because that's what monasticism was doing. It was trying to reach evangelical perfection, not in the fear of God and in faith, but in abandoning civil responsibilities. So we reject those who are going into the the monasteries to avoid, to abandon civil responsibilities. Monasticism is not a way toward evangelical perfection at the cost of not participating in life with your neighbors. You can't just check out of this world and say, hey, it's your problem. We're out of here. Peace. 
were joined in the monastery. In the meantime, the gospel does not undermine government or family, but completely requires both their preservation as ordinances of God and the exercise of love in these ordinances. Consequently, Christians owe obedience to their magistrates and laws, except when commanded to sin. For then they owe greater obedience to God than to human beings, Acts 5, 29. Okay, so this section is especially helpful regarding the talk of Christian nationalism, because we see that as Christians, we can disapprove of of human tyranny in the civil realm, of abuses to our, our governmental system and things like this, and simultaneously condemn those who bear the name Christian, all the while advocating for a non-biblical perspective of how Christians live in the church and the state. So we can do the two things at the same time. We can speak up against uh, the, the governmental tyranny and the problems we see in the government, and we can also say, hey, we're not with those guys. We're not with the wacky dudes who are trying to you know, establish some sort of uh, theocracy or something. No, we're, we're not that. So we can do both at the same time. As we read in Article 28, the Lutheran Reformers did not advocate for a state church, and they condemned the papacy's attempts to transfer earthly kingdoms and to take away from emperors the right to rule. So put that in modern language. We would condemn you know, taking away from our elected officials, our public servants, their authority— and then just give it to the pastors or give it to the church or you know have have the clergy kind of becoming these things like they were in the medieval ages where they were the bishop would would had churchly duties but also he was running the state in many ways we're condemning that but also here in article 16 we make clear that we also denounce the so-called christian behavior of prohibiting involvement in the civil realm we're not ever going to advocate of checking out from living in this world and being participants in trying to influence the world in the name of Christ for the blessing of our neighbor. We want to serve our neighbors, and the way we do that is living in the civil realm. So we name the Anabaptist by name, I should also add, it's okay to do that, and the practice of monasticism, condemning two things by name, both advocated as a hands-off approach to the civil realm, the things of the state. We're just getting started. we got two more segments to go, so stick around. You're listening to Cross Defense. We'll be back right after this break. Showing support for KFUO is now easier than ever. You can sport a KFUO shirt, swag, or even socks by visiting our online store. Go to kfuo.org slash store and order high-quality KFUO-branded merch. You no longer need to wait for our annual share for a chance to show your KFUO spirit. Visually share and wear this ministry out in the world by checking out our selection. Every purchase helps to support our proclamation of Christ for you, anytime, anywhere. Go to kfuo.org slash store. So, are Lutherans Christian nationalists? That's what we want to find out. That's what we want to know. Well, not if what is meant by that term is the church usurping the power of the government, the state, taking hold of the sword to establish a theocracy. No, we are the farthest thing from Christian nationalists you will ever find in that sense. This is something the Roman Church has pushed for and carried out in ages past. And the American founders, if we know our history and we're not blinded by the revisionist version of it, the American founders fled this theocratic persecution. This is also something to be noted that that the Reformed teachers have taught this before. Those influenced by Zwingli have, have taught this idea and have pushed for it, but not Lutherans. Lutherans have a clear, sharp understanding of the separation between church and state. As we said, long before Thomas Jefferson ever coined the phrase in his letter to the Danbury Baptists, 
Lutherans were writing about this. And they, in fact, in turn, influenced those who would write in the 16th and 17th century that in England and other parts of Europe that would then influence our founding in this way. So we're not Christian nationalists, full stop. But I did say in this sense before, and I say in this sense because what I want you to note is that this term is not used in a simple, straightforward way. More often than not, the way we're hearing this term used is to define us, to define all Christians who have biblical worldviews that they would like to see influence the civil realm. It's used as a pejorative word to define all Christians with civic views that have been shaped and normed and formed by Scripture. Well, that's exactly what the Christian is supposed to do. We're supposed to get our understanding, things of the mind, the soul, from the gospel, from the word of God, and we're supposed to take that understanding and we're supposed to carry it with us into our vocations in the civic realm. And so in that sense, if what we mean by Christian nationalist is a Christian who carries his faith into the nation and wants it to shape the nation he lives in, well then yes. It's still a pejorative term, but we'll own it in that sense. See, usually it's employed, Christian nationalist, is employed as a thought-terminating cliche. Are you familiar with this kind of language? It's a semantic stop sign. It's shut down the conversation. We're done here. See, that's what, the, that's what a thought-terminating cliche does. It, it's an ugly word, a dirty word intended to end a conversation or, or paint someone in a negative light. Like when people in the community call me a Nazi or a hater or a bigot or a racist, something like that. It's meant to uh, not only shut down conversation, but it's also meant to keep everybody else from wanting to associate with us. It's one of those. Once upon a time, the word American was one of these thought stoppers. Those loyal to the crown would use the word American pejoratively to smear residents of the colonies who wanted representation in their legal system, who wanted uh, freedom and liberty, the ability to make their own choices on this side of the pond. Well, the opponents of those folks would call them Americans in a negative light to keep other people in the English colonies and, and back in, in England from wanting to associate with someone who's an American. Lutheran, too was used this way by the papacy, by the Roman Catholic Church. During the whole Reformation drama, Lutheran was a dirty word. And so Lutheran even had to defend himself and say, I don't want any of God's children to be called with my name. Who am I, a maggot like me, to have God's children named after me, called by my name? He hated it. He had to defend it, that, that he didn't want that. He wasn't starting, starting to, or, <laughs> he wasn't trying to start a sect he wasn't making a new religion. He saw everybody as Christian. But the term stuck. It was a negative. It was an insult that people would use to steer clear of Lutherans. Same goes, actually, for Christian. It was a cut down, a curse, an insult. Yeah, don't think Christians have never been subject to schoolyard ribbing. That our contemporaries, from the very beginning of our existence, didn't try to use rhetoric to shame us into submission and silence. It's always been a part of being a Christian. It's one of Satan's good old standbys. He loves it. As Luther said in a letter to some of the politicians of his day, Fortune would have it that whenever the holy word of God blossoms forth, Satan opposes it with all his might by employing, first of all, his fist, the fist and outrageous force. And when this method proves unsuccessful, he attacks it with evil tongues and false spirits and teachings. What he cannot quench with force, he suppresses with deceit and falsehood. That's from Luther's letter to the princes of Saxony concerning the rebellious spirit, if you want to look that up. 
There is this great ancient drawing. I think it might be the oldest depiction of a crucifix. I don't know about that for sure. So if I'm wrong about that, don't hold me to it. And if you know something different, let me know, would you? But this this ancient drawing is from the third century, and it was discovered in the quarters that housed Rome's imperial pages, these schoolboys on the Palatine Hill in Rome. It was drawn by a young hand, the experts can tell, I guess. And it's a, it's a picture of a boy facing the cross in a posture of worship. And on the cross is a man with the head of a donkey. An obvious insult, right? Underneath the drawing, it says, Alexamenos worships his God. It's mockery that we worship the donkey-headed God, right? Use your imagination there. We're here to excite, excite the imagination. Well, even back then, in the third century, calling someone, naming someone after a donkey was an insult. Alexamenos was a Christian imperial page, and at least one of his schoolmates was making fun of him for it. And you can almost hear the childhood cruelty, right? I mean, we, we know childhood is a time of cruelty. Kids are mean. I hate it. It bums me out. But it's true. Alex is a Christian. Alex is a Christian. Right? This kind of thing. But Alex Zamanos was a Christian. <laughs> he was a Christian. So, being a Christian, he wasn't swayed by his peers. He didn't care about their insults. Bring it on, guys. Bring it on. I can take it. Under the drawing, we read another inscription. There's an inscription under the inscription. In a different hand, the experts say. And it reads, Alexamenos is faithful. Maybe he wrote it about himself in response as a defense. Maybe, maybe someone else witnessed his undeterred faithfulness in the face of rhetorical mudslinging that was written about him. And so they wrote it under there to correct it, to add to it. We don't know. But we do know that insults have always been a part of of the attempt to silence Christianity. So Christian nationalism is one of these pejorative terms. It's one of these thought-terminating cliches. It's an insult. It's an ugly word. Derogatory terms are tools in the arsenal of our ancient foe. Now, my thought, as I consider Christian nationalism, is that it's just another one of these verbal allergens meant to keep keep people away from the thought that Christians should bring their beliefs with them into the civic realm. Let it shape the public discourse of the nation in as much as Christians are involved in that discourse. That's my thought. So American Christians have long observed that the founding values of the United States were in line with and even informed by Christian tenets. And and we've long observed that as a society, we've been drifting away from those original principles and into something different, a neo-paganism, if you will. Unfettered godlessness came of age in this country especially with the post-war baby boom, that generation. There's no offense to the boomers, to individuals. I'm talking about the generation. And it's given birth to unchurched and uncatechized offspring. And so we have millennials and Gen Zers who don't know anything about church or Jesus. The godlessness has grown, stro- has grown stronger and stronger among our neighbors in correspondence with the church's ever-weakening voice. And so now we're to a point where what we've been praying for every Sunday for decades, that is, public servants who carry out their vocations in accordance with God's wisdom, they don't have to be Christian, but they would just operate according to natural reason, the way God ordained things in nature. Common sense, guy. We're to a point where that, our prayer for that, is demonized as an assault on America. True story. Christian nationalism. We're now to the point 
that when an elected official uses overt biblical language and not just, you know, generic patronizing blasphemies, when they use overt biblical references, they're called Christian nationalism, or nationalists. That that's cited as evidence of Christian nationalism on the rise. But cross defense. Cross defense is about equipping the mind to make a defense for the hope that is within us, right? All right. So we're undeterred by thought terminating cliches. Lutherans don't care. We're going to call it how we see it. That's what Lutherans do. And we're going to engage in discourse. We're not going to let somebody call us a name and shut us down. We're going to keep coming back. Give us the whooping. We'll keep coming back and we'll keep engaging you and we'll fight for your soul the whole time. Is there a concern over some wacky, charismatic, enthusiast, heretic wanting to establish an American theocracy? I guess there might be that concern. That might be something that, you know, the academics and the theologians and often the schools are talking about. Maybe, I suppose. But what's the greater, more pressing threat, my friends? We're not really worried about the formation of a theocracy in America, are we? Are we? No. But we are really concerned about a state comprised of authoritarian officials attempting to control, as the Augsburg Confession, Article 28 says, minds, rather than protect bodies and goods. What do we read? What do we, what do we read? The magistrate protects not minds, but bodies and goods from manifest harm and constrains people with the sword and physical penalties. The gospel, the gospel, the church protects minds. And as the Augsburg Confession says, protects minds from ungodly ideas. You know, things like uh, transgenderism, things like racism, things like uh, the idea that we evolved from an amoeba, this, this sort of th- stuff, right? That's the church protects minds from that. The magistrates are supposed to protect bodies from injury. They are supposed to punish evildoers, bear the sword. The gospel protects the minds from ungodly ideas, the devil and eternal death, the Augsburg Confession says. We've seen the overreach of the state in in very recent years. This isn't like an ancient past thing. We've seen it. We're still seeing it coming out of the COVID-19 stuff. The the pandemic revealed the misunderstanding of many of our politicians. Overreach was and is rampant in many of our states. And beyond that, we see it with the abortion debate, homosexual unions, the ungodly ideas of racism, like I said, gender dysphoria, being taught in state-funded public schools, all kinds of things that are opposed to God's word, the inability for our children to, to even pray, these sorts of things. These things are happening because to a large part, we're letting them. We're self-censoring for fear of being labeled Christian nationalists, fascists, Nazis, racists, bigots, homophobes, and every other verbal allergen people can think of. And we're not speaking up as citizens who've, who have vocations in the civil realm and are to use those vocations for the good of our neighbor. As Leif Grain puts it in his commentary on the Augsburg Confession, it is in the secular kingdom, in one's calling, his vocation, that one is crucified, made subject to the law. Through the secular kingdom, that cross is laid upon the person in his or her calling. Through the spiritual kingdom, The resurrection is proclaimed and made effective by the gospel. That's from the Augsburg Confession of Commentary, Leif Grain, published in 1987, at least the version I have. Rather than letting academics, news anchors, and talking heads spin us up with fear about being labeled Christian nationalists, we each need to ask ourselves, am I bearing my cross? It was the state that laid the cross on Christ's back. 
Are we throwing off our crosses that Jesus told us we are to take up? And are we throwing them off with biblical justification dripping from our lips? Honest question. It's through the secular kingdom that the cross is laid upon the person in his calling, in your vocation. Are we avoiding our cross? Are we avoiding being called names? It's not even much of a cross, is it? No, it's not. Are we avoiding that? And using, this is, this is the temptation for the Christian. Are we using the Bible's language, scriptural vocabulary, to justify our cross shirking? Is that what's going on? I hope not. I pray not. We're going to take a break. We'll be right back. You're listening to Cross Defense, and we're talking about Christian nationalism. Ooh, things are getting tense in here. (laughs) We'll be right back. Iron sharpens iron, and one man sharpens another. Put this wisdom of God into practice by listening to Sharper Iron on KFUO. I'm your host, Pastor Timothy Apple. And faithful pastors from around the world help sharpen my faith in Christ every episode. I know you'll be blessed by listening and studying God's Word with us. Listen to Sharper Iron weekdays at 8 a.m. on KFUO and on demand at KFUO.org, the KFUO radio app, and anywhere you get your podcasts. Lutherans understand the proper separation between the church and state. We know, you know, my friends, that God rules the two kingdoms in two different ways. The word, God's word reigns in the church. The sword, ad nes, the sword reigns in the state. We know, to quote Leif Grain again, that the attempt to form a Christian society is not only hopelessly utopian, which the Lutheran reformers, having no false illusions about the world, realized. We know that that's hopelessly utopian. It's not going to happen. That is to say, as Reverend Pieper puts it, we know that the use of state laws and powers does not advance the building of the church because the church is a congregation of believers and is born and sustained solely by the gospel. The use of civil powers hinders the growth of the church if the false principle bears its natural fruit. We know this. So we're not pushing for a theocracy. That said, we also know that the powers and principalities that would love to keep the church from having a voice in the public square advocate for a wholly different and unfounded separation of church and state, one that is hostile to Christ and his people. And, we ought to add, one that is hostile to the history and intent of America's founding and pre wilsonian history. The current secular state would love us all to be Anabaptists or monastics. That's what they want from us. They want all Christians to be Anabaptists who reject all civil involvement and say, Christians can't do that sort of thing and still be Christian. Or be monastics and say, we could do that stuff, but it's not very holy. We're going to go over here and try to perfect our our Christianity, being righteous and holy. The state loves that. That's what they want us to do. Keep your Christianity behind closed doors in your private life. But Lutherans, of all Christians, Lutherans say, hey, wait, bud. This is my civil realm, too. I live in this world. Yes, I go to church, and yes, God's word shapes my every single step, my last breath. Everything I do is shaped by it, and guess what? Because of that, I'm going to be the best citizen you will ever have in this land, but you're going to hear my voice. I am going to speak, and we can definitely do that here in America because our form of government, the order of governance that we have inherited, is one that we are the sovereigns and the public servants, they serve us, the people. Do you remember what Pieper said from the last episode, what I read in the last episode? The Lutheran Church advocates neither democracy, nor oligarchy, nor monarchy, 
we don't we don't pick and choose. We don't we don't advocate one over the other, but simply acknowledges the existing form of government as God's order. We're recognizing who's in charge of the form of government, right? And and from the Augsburg Confession, the gospel teaches an eternal righteousness of the heart. Meanwhile, it does not destroy the state or the family, but very much requires that they be preserved as ordinances of God. We are fighting for the preservation of the state being ran by the state people that could very well be Christian, but who are exercising their vocations according to their vocations, not trying to implement a theocracy, Christian nationalism. In our existing form of government, all people have a voice. All people, all citizens of this country have a voice. And none of us have to leave our beliefs at home when we use our voices. It's not Christian nationalism to want America to return to the Christian values that many of us can still remember being a part of our culture. And that many more of us See in the historical record of our country. You and I aren't calling for a a national church of the United States when we bring our faith into public discourse and push for a religious and moral society. It's not Christian nationalism to identify the historic reality that at the time of the American Revolution, nine Count them, nine of the 13 colonies had conferred special benefits upon one church to the exclusion of others. I know, I know. Whoa, what happened to diversity, equity, and inclusion? My teacher said that that's always been a part of the American ideal. Ah, don't listen to that. It's not true. It's not Christian nationalism to recognize that our existing form of government wasn't founded on those neo-Marxist wokeisms that our young people are being told is the American way. Now, Brian, a listener of the show, wrote this. I know a lot of people, Brian says, who are close or around me that can claim to be Christian, but absolutely do nothing in their life, which, nothing in their life would suggest that they are Christian, such as no praying, no church, no reading scripture, Not to mention their worldview is the world and what's on TV, not scripture. I always think of the Bible verse, Brian says, you believe that God is one, you do well, even the the demons believe and they shudder, James 2, 19. Which does make me very concerned for them that they believe God exists, but they don't have the Holy Spirit. Since I'm a Lutheran, it's a battle to ask myself this question about about them, these people around him. Because it feels like I'm coming from a works righteousness point of view, but at the same time, I wonder, wouldn't a Christian want these things, even if they don't get it right 100% of the time? I know I want these things, but there are times I miss a prayer or skip Sunday when I shouldn't. My approach has been only to speak truth when they speak lies based on what I've learned from Scripture, and I pray for them. Is this the best approach? Thank you, Brian K. Well, Brian, what a great opportunity for us to bring up your your question. Thank you for, for sending it in. I appreciate it. Your comment shows why we're hearing reports of Christian nationalism being on the rise, why why the, the journalists, the news media are making such a big stink about the Christian right, as they like to say, the threat of it to democracy. And many people claim to be Christian, as you identify, and yet they aren't living out their faith. The scriptures are supposed to norm our lives. The Holy Spirit sanctifies us and motivates us by the gospel to live as those who love Christ and who have the love of Christ for others that it's within us for a reason. That we are a people set apart from the world, a people who live not only in word and talk, but also in deeds and truth. 
that we're in the world, but not of the world, right? That's the right way of saying that. Christians who are doing that are now being called Christian nationalists because we're living in deed and truth in the civil realm that God calls us into to serve our neighbors. Now, Brian, you also mentioned the precursor to this current semantic stop sign that we're talking about. And that is the argument that when Christians discern what's going on in the world and they speak up about it, that, that we're called judgmental. Another thought terminating cliche. And this is why you, you said that you have this battle within yourself. Praise be to God that you're struggling with this. The old Adam and the new man are contending and the new man will win. Because you say it feels like you're coming from a works righteousness point of view, but at the same time, you know these things are wrong and that what, you know, what's right, you know the difference according to God's word from what you said, from, from what you've learned from scripture. And, and you want someone to reprove you, to rebuke you, to teach you the truth. You would want that if the shoe was on the other foot. And it often is on the other foot, and you don't even realize it because you're, you're open and receptive to instruction. See, it's Satan's lie to counter what Paul teaches in 2 Timothy 3, 12 to 17. This should be familiar to many of us. Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted, while evil people and imposters will go on from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. But as for you, Continue in what you've learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it, and how from childhood you've been acquainted with the sacred writings, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, <laughs> for reproof is how you say that word, for correction and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. Thanks for writing in, Brian. You ask, is there a better approach? Is this the best approach, you ask? Brother, the best approach is being in the life of these people around you and being the Christian man you are, speaking up from a, a humble, a humble posture with a humble spirit as, as it's obvious you have. You're not commenting, at least what I've, writ, what, what I've read from you, is not a comment coming from a place of works righteousness, but one of love and concern for other people. So be humble in your approach as you are, and speak the truth in love to those around you, brother, however, however you may have the opportunity. I think you're on the right track. I think what you're doing is great. When lies are presented in, in your presence and, and you know the truth from Scripture, you, you speak up. That's what we're called to do. You're not called to go out on some crusade and tell everybody they're wrong about every little thing. No, just as it comes, as it comes, be the faithful man you are. Thanks for writing in and thanks for showing your comment. I know you didn't realize this, but your comment, as we're taking on Christian nationalism, your comment shows us why the secular world is starting to notice Christians are living out their faith. Now they're calling it the wrong thing, and they're they're lumping us all together, and they want to they want to portray it as if we're we're pushing for a theocracy, but that's not the case, at least not for the historic Christians. No, tell me tell me, does this sound familiar to you guys? Francis Schaeffer, 1981, he writes this. Today, the separation of church and state in America is used to silence the church. When Christians speak out on issues. The hue and cry from the humanist state and the humanist media is that Christians are prohibited from speaking since there is a separation of church and state. Mm. The way the concept is used today, as opposed to the way the Lutherans used it in the Augsburg Confession, eh, is totally reversed from the original intent. The consequence of the acceptance of this doctrine leads to the removal of religion as an influence on in civil government. And that, my friends, if it sounds familiar to you, it should, that, my friends, is the whole intent. That's what our opponents are doing. That's what people who do not believe in Jesus and do not want Christians 
to bring their belief into the public discourse are doing. This is the spirit behind the thought-terminating cliché Christian nationalism, as well as all the other ones. Christians are afraid of the cross of name-calling. We don't want to bear being called a name. Why? Why? I think Luther would be called a Christian nationalist in me, in the media today, don't you? I do. The pastor in the Reformation, that pastor, Pastor Martin Luther, was a prolific writer and was constantly writing to the civil leaders of his day, to the politicians, the princes, trying to persuade them to carry out policies that were in keeping with Scripture. Here, let's take a glance at just a, a few titles a few of his works that would have earned Luther the label Christian nationalist. How about this one? A sermon on the estate of marriage. And you're like, well, why? <laughs> of course, don't you see? Preaching that marriage was instituted by God to be filled by a man and a woman, not a man and a man or a woman and a woman. And that in this institution, scripture is normative for the husband and the wife's behavior. <laughs> well, man, in America, that's that's now considered a political topic. Because of the homosexual marriage thing, the same-sex union thing, all this discourse we've been having for all these years, that's considered politics. And the church is not supposed to speak to it. Pastors preaching the biblical truth about marriage are being accused of being political. I know I am. Why is that? Because the state is now trying to direct the realm of the mind. What about this letter? To the Christian nobility of the German nation concerning the reform of the Christian estate. What's a professor of a state university in Wittenberg doing expressing Christian views? And how in the world did any of those nobility become nobility? Who let the Christians hold a political office in Germany? Christian nationalists, the lot of you, right? Temporal authority, to what extent it should be obeyed. Insurrectionist is what he would be called today, probably, I would guess. We're just reading headlines, you know, Twitter stuff, just scrolling through our feed. How about this letter? To the councilmen of all cities in Germany, that they establish and maintain Christian schools. What? <laughs> yeah, I know, right? It's almost as bad as the Northwest Ordinance of 1787 here in America, which was passed by the United States Congress in 1789, setting aside federal property in the Northwest Te Territory for Christian schools, stating, and I quote, religion, morality, and knowledge are necessary to good government and the happiness of mankind. Were the members of the United States Congress in 1789 all Christian nationalists? By today's standard, I'd say yeah as well as the 1811 New York Chief Justice, James Kent. Yes, there was a time in our history when a New York court upheld an indictment for blasphemous utterances against Jesus. In that ruling, Chief Justice Kent said, we are Christian people, and the morality of the country is deeply engrafted upon Christianity. See, here's the overall point, my friends. Christian nationalism is nothing more than a thought-terminating cliché these days. It's what I like to call that verbal allergen to get people to stay away from us, to stop listening to us, to any Christian bringing his biblical view into the public discourse. It's intended to scare away anyone listening to you because you've been labeled negatively. You have nothing to fear about bringing your faith into the civil realm. That's what we're supposed to do. Now, sometimes it will result in wonderful temporal blessings for our neighbors an entire season and era of these blessings. All will go on peacefully and without tension. At other times, however, it will result in wonderful opportunity for you to bear your Christian cross. And guess what? History shows us that when we bear our wonderful cross, it will also bear wonderful eternal blessings for all those who witness the faithfulness that the Holy Spirit has worked within us just as it did for Alexamenos and all the martyrs. It's as Peter and John said to the Jewish council in Acts 4, 
when they were arrested for influencing the countrymen with belief in Christ Jesus, crucified and resurrected. What did they say? Acts 4, 18 to 20. So they called them and charged them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered them, whether it's right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than to God, you must judge. For we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. And then what did they do? They all went back to their friends, the church, and they, they all prayed to God that he would grant his servants boldness to speak his word. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the word of God with boldness. And then they're called before the Sanhedrin again. <laughs> Continue on in Christ, my friends. His spirit dwells within you. Speak with boldness and let the thought stoppers call you whatever they want. Like Alexamenos, you are faithful and the insults are nothing more than added reason to rejoice in the redemption of of our crucified and risen Lord, Jesus Christ. That's it for today. Go in peace, my friends. Christ be with you. Cross Defense is a production of KFUO Radio. Find past episodes and support Cross Defense at kfuo.org.